Okay, this is version control chapter, which is something that uh, we really uh, need to, to, to go a bit more in deep and see uh, and understand how it works. Um, because um, it's very important to, to have uh, some controls on, uh, on the project that, that we do, uh, especially if we work on a team uh, but even if we uh, work on our own project, uh, sometimes it can happen to lose some information, do not recall where they are, uh, see what you made, any changes. Um, so this chapter turns out very interesting, uh, but um, so we are going to the chapter, but we given us uh, some that you have some reached already some level with GitHub. Because, so we don't go through the installation process uh, mm -hmm. of the virtual control uh, tool. We suppose to, to know everything about that, but we want to like little set, um, set up the, those little things that the, that will be useful for um, be able to use more features uh, um, uh, around the GitHub and the, um, and within our studio uh, when we make a project and we do research for for some uh, answering some questions. So. Uh, learning objectives for this chapter are what version control is, why is important, how can we use it, and then we will see some extra features that we can add to our tool. Uh, this chapter, uh, in this chapter, we will focus on Git and GitHub as tools for version control, in particular while using a studio for dealing with projects uh, version control. Um, as I said, um, we, we give some for us given, so we're supposed to have already reached some level, we have uh, GitHub installed on our machine, um, if it, this is not the case, at the end of the notes, there are some uh, resources uh, provided even in the book. So mm -hmm. following some direction, it will be possible to install the tool and uh, reach this, this point. So but we, we know how to do it. Uh, and uh, what we are talking about is Git and GitHub. Okay, these tools so, uh, are the tools that let you keep the control uh, of your project about the version, about the things inside, about everything that uh, it will keep the project more secure. So, um, um, why we want to use version control, why um, it might be uh, that useful? Because it happened that a piece of code, uh, entire script disappeared. Uh, basically, we do some things very fast somehow, and we don't know where it's gone. So that would be useful because uh, it uh, helps you to trace back the, all the changes you have made in your uh, repository as well as in your project. So you may need also to integrate some changes if you work on a team. So that, that's also very important because you, uh, when you work on a team, you might, it might happen that um, someone made a change and you don't know, maybe you don't realize that the change happened. So in this case, all is traced and all is very evident. So you can see where the change happened, basically. Uh, and also, um, you can uh, uh, several people can synchronize and collaborate on same project. Uh, find something back if it's not. Uh, you don't remember where is it. 
where it is and safely track changes. So um, uh, basically more info on how to download Git and GitHub as I said can, uh, will be available uh, in this book. And this book is very important. I don't know if you have seen it. Hmm. This Epi Git book. Uh, if I click, it doesn't open it. Okay, fantastic. So I need to uh, knit it again. Uh, this Epi Git. Let's see if I can go. Epi Git book. This book is also very interesting, okay? Um, this uh, goes very in deep about Git, how to install it and everything. Uh, and then we'll use it to, to, to see some things uh, within this chapter. Okay, so um, we assume that um, as I said, everything uh, is already installed. And then um, one important thing to say, if, if you have any questions about uh, installing and everything, I don't think, but uh, just interrupt me. Um, so the basic commands for using GitHub is add, commit, push and pull, and we know how to use it. Add is for adding things like uh, from, from our studio or from directly from the Git repository, uh, as well as commit, push and pull. Um, one, uh, one important thing is uh, when you set up your GitHub, you, need, you, you, might, have, you might encounter some uh, difficulties at the begin with uh, setting up the your path uh, and Git can ask, keep asking you about credentials and everything. So it will be important to set uh, these commands, uh, Git creds uh, using this, this uh, package and Git cred set uh, to set up your path. But as, uh, as I said, um, you can find more information in the resources and even in the happy uh, Git book. Okay, so as I said, um, I have personally have encountered some, some issues, uh, but then uh, um, let's say with a little practice, um, with time, within time using Git and GitHub, uh, that things will be more clear and you can do things faster. Um, for example, about branches, when th this is our point, you know, the book didn't mention about our issues, okay? Just said that uh, we have, uh, when you set up a repository, uh, a main branch is settled, and then uh, uh, this, this will be the main branch from, for, for the owner of the, re the repository. Then any other in the team uh, will have uh, to rename the, so make a new branch, rename the branch differently from main, and then push the changes from, from this second, uh, secondary branch. But he, uh, the, the book doesn't go much in deep about uh, all the things that happen within branches. Uh, the, the, mm, mm, let's, and that's, yes. it's kind of surprising really that it, it does kind of um, so little content on branches because mm. they are the, the, the thing that allows synchronized working uh, across a team on the same files. Uh, it, 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 well, in my opinion, at least, and I don't know that there's there's a figure in the book that just shows a kind of a bunch of dots connected by arrows as a kind of illustration of what a branch is, and I, d I don't think it really 
Well, you know, I'll, were I I'll someone who used that. Git for my own projects and never worked in branches or with other collaborators? I don't think it would be particularly revealing to me. Um, I've got a question for both members, Frederica yeah. and, and uh, uh, Russ. Do you use the GUI interface of R for using Git or, or, or all of your commits and pushes and pulls, or do you do it via command line? And I, 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 it's, a, it's a school of thought that I'm af, uh, after or asking the question. I see a lot of benefit with doing it from command line. I haven't been able to exercise it with efficiency. Uh, I keep, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a muscle memory thing I've got to work on. Um, mm -hmm. I always find myself, reverting back to the to the GUI side of things just because it's more click happy, but um, for speed and efficiency, mm. using it on the terminal would be easier. Federica? Um, okay. Um, basically, um, as I share my experience, um, since I, I stumped on uh, GitHub, I have installed Git, okay? And so the uh, the things on my computer, and I've started using from 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 that from that point of view, okay, because it's a different point of view. Um, but then I realized that uh, I don't need, I didn't need it. So uh, it's good for you to because when you fork a repository, you have everything inside, and you can make changes. Sometimes it requires to pass through it for making important changes but if you store the repositories and, and you make changes from there then um, I have started using another computer which is a laptop and uh, I didn't want to install uh, git on my uh, on my laptop I use it just the github online version my repository from and um, Actually, I didn't need it to, to get inside there anymore. Right. So I have it on the other, the fixed uh, computer, but uh, it's quite a while that I don't get inside. Um, if I do get inside, it's um, like uh, something that stores store things inside that I don't need it because um, um, I don't know your, your experience, but, uh, but by my side, it's uh, something that I would uh, uh, require to, um, to to relate with in case uh, I need to make important changes, mm. like updating something of about uh, I don't know or dealing with the repositories from there. Yeah. What about you? Um, I don't know. Uh, to be honest, there's very few things that I write now that I don't use Git for, even for things that are like, you know, even if it's like my CV or something like that, and where I, I, there's no sense in which I'll be collaborating on it with anyone else. Um, it's very rare that I don't call, keep things on GitHub and, uh, and, and, and work with them in, in Git. Um, and even for things like that I, I i do use branches even in things that are completely personal projects but yeah i've i mean when i when i was originally learning git though i did have some problems with it in terms of like um how it uh interacts with a lot of the other tools that i was using to write with so like how you use it to store things like word documents or you know text documents that can be converted into word and things like that i don't really use words so much anymore but um yeah and i i mean i've tripped up at almost every stage with git <laughs> over the years yeah. but i've used it for such a long time now that i i i just find it an extremely useful tool for almost every part of my working life now one of the one of the sorry Frederica, go ahead no no say the um, as i said um it's like uh, r and r studio 
So yeah. I see the things like our studio is my GitHub on uh, on Chrome on internet, mm. my interface, and uh, Git is something else, and GitLab as well. The both the, uh, are sort of R. So the, the 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 base the structure of the thing that you store in in your computer, and in case there is a, a call for um make important changes i don't know if you need to mm. um you can even have project inside your gitlab okay yeah. and yeah. and modify the things from there but personally for the things that i do uh at the moment i don't don't rely with that okay mm. yeah that's perfectly understandable though yeah, yeah. cool but uh, on the um uh, the question ryan asked about about um, command line using uh, the R Studio versus yes. the command line. I, uh, to be honest, I, I I do use the R Studio thing every now and then, but right. mostly I'm using it from the terminal because yeah. I just n know the commands. And I, I was pretty experienced with Git before they added the Git um, section to the. Uh, to, to our studio so I, I just I, continued using the command line one of the um, one of the biggest uh, uh, hurdles that I'm working through and it, it's it, this is a personal thing but I want to share it with anybody that may be listening uh, yeah. or are watching this video again so subversion versus get uh, SVN versus get uh, two very very different paradigms of doing almost the same objectives what you find is that the syntax of, of doing it from command line is ever so slightly different. And that is where a lot of the possible mm. confusion may come in. I was watching a lot of, uh, uh, is it Tan? I think is one of our, yeah. our uh, main, um, uh, not hosts, what are you, uh, moderators. moderators. And uh, I, I jumped on one of his uh, channels. I can't remember the name of that Discord. It's a link from Discord, but he does videos. Anyway, I was watching a couple of his videos and he'll do just get commits through command line. And I find it very quick because you never leave the screen and it, there's nothing else of disruption that pops up in front of you that you have to interact with. It's it's yeah, all just yeah. the same user interface. And so therefore I find value in, in maintaining that. Um, it kind of goes back to the whole Vim versus Emacs uh, conversation of, you know, the, the shortest keyboard shortcuts of whatever you're doing. If you have to reach over to your mouse, obviously you've, you've wasted additional uh, energy and it's not being lazy. It's actually just being efficient with your time. And so therefore I just wanted to throw that in there. I wanted to see what your your own opinions are on that same thought process, but. Hi. So the, 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 the feature that you mentioned uh, is this one or the other one with the colors and everything. So wh where he mentions about the, uh, this one here, which one was the feature that you said, Russ? Oh, uh, the thing I was talking about, um, is the um, the the Git panel within our studio? I think it only comes up if you have a uh, ah, a okay. w whether it's a package structure or whether it's a a, a, a project structure. Um, w when you're working in our studio, there'll be a Git panel up in the you know where your environments panel is and and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's it is quite useful, but it uh, it only provides a, a limited number of the commands that you uh, of the pro, you know the processes that you could do using the command line and get um, are available through that. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, it it came a bit late in the day for me to switch to using it for everything, but it is quite nice. I mean, anyway. But um, the thing that the book says about the branches is that, um, um, where, where is my thing? Okay, it says that uh, uh, there's few, um, 
Okay. You, um, when, when you open up um, a new repository, you have a main branch, and then uh, this branch basically passes through a developer branch, which is dev. Okay. Just automatically. Um, so it's, it's like your main branch, an interface of the branch, which is inside the, 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 the thing. And then there are feature branches that mm, can be renamed. And there is this hot fix uh, to correct critical issue in, in the main branch. And this turns to where's the, where is it? The uh, picture um, here um, shows the things quite clearly. So basically, um, this is the master branch. And the master branch uh, uh, receive um, in, uh, input from other branches. This input pass through the develop, the dev branch. If all, um, all these steps uh, succeed, then uh, re uh, release the things Mm. and then pass to the odd fixes and then finally reach the master branch. So this is um, a picture, this is from another book, um, sorry, um, a blog post, which I have put the, the resource uh, mm. in the notes and you can find in the book as well. It's quite nice, but you need to like look uh, other mm, other things to understand. Have you seen when you push um, something from your R studio that reach the that reaches the uh, main repository? So you you make a commit and then push. It reaches the the the, the GitHub repository, the main repository, and then uh, start some some processes starting, no? In, uh, they are step by step verifying all the uh, information that you uh, have pushed and, and, and you want to, to reach the main branch. Uh, and if there's no conflict, it finally uh, merged and appear on the, on the main branch. What happens inside within all these passages is that um, inside there are layers of um, verification. Mm. For example, yeah, yeah. yeah um, when, a, a, for example, if a step doesn't verify, it goes back. So, so something ar uh, arrives to the develop, so to the dev branch, then goes back, if, if it doesn't succeed, goes back to the, to the original secondary branch, and then you make the change, the, uh, if there's any changes to make, and then it goes back again uh, until um, it succeeds. And when finally all is green, Uh, will be released to, to the master. But what is the odd fixes? Uh, I didn't... Uh, okay, okay. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I think in, in, this Im in this image, I, I mean, I've seen this image in a few different uh, places. Um, so what is... Uh, what, it, what it's indicating on the, on the very right-hand side is the master branch, and this is the branch. So if you've got an app that's viewable by the public or something like that it's only ever deployed to the website from the master branch and um any kind of development work be it that you're writing a, a new feature or fixing some bugs or something like that should go on in um feature branches or or uh, and and be 
merged via a develop branch. So you might be working towards releasing a new version of the app, but all the work that goes into building that new version of the app goes on in that yellow develop branch or it all gets merged into that. And once everyone's happy that the, the new version of the app is releasable, then does it get merged into master and released to the world? What the hot fixes are is where if you find, say, upon releasing, upon kind of deploying an app such that it's gone live, if you find a bug that means that the app crashes uh, for everyone, I don't know, for everyone in Asia, say it crashes or something like that, or if there's some other kind of critical bug that means that the app it, the app in its deployed state is failing in in some way um that's when you would write a hotfix so you would branch off the deployed version of the app write the code to fix that app and then put that and then merge that back into the master branch and then deploy from that immediately rather than having to go through um merging into the developer the development branch uh waiting a few months before the the kind of newer version of the app is is written for it to be if it's a really critical bug that needs to be fixed within an hour or within a day or something like that you should do that work on branch that you take off the master branch and merge back into the master branch rather than in a developed branch because the developed branch has a much longer kind of lag time before the code that's in there gets released to the real world um i don't know whether that explains it i might just yeah. throw more uh, no, i was i was going to add hot fixes are are very uh uh in the moment kind of of uh, changes uh it's it's you've already deployed it it's already configured the server's running and all of a sudden you realize i need to go change something the uh, the hot fix kind concept is is something of being very careful that uh, you don't actually crash the server worse than what it already is um i wanted to ask a question frederica in in our monday session of of ggplot we were talking about network diagrams and so setting up two things setting up a diagram like this, uh, being able to read the nodes of all of your commits and then pr produce some kind of visualization to another user. I really take a lot of, uh, uh, I really like the photos like this where you're adding kind of comments to the team. Tagging as a service, tagging is another layer on, I guess, almost like human interaction with it. You don't want to deal with the hex value of a commit, right? Tracing with that is kind of a little bit funny from a human standpoint, a computer doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just looking at, at, at the data for that one uh, instance. By adding a tag to it, now you're, you're giving a, another human readable visibility to it. The tagging process though also has another paradigm that goes along with. So uh, does it increment or is it something that you have to physically remember what your next tag is going to be. Um, this might be more suited for us in, in the use of that tagging process. I don't think so. Um, uh, um, Have you worked yeah. on, a, on a development software package that has version control or, or has tagging to it, you know, with, with changes in code, release notes that go along with those changes, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, like um, uh, all the R packages that I've worked on do that, you know, tagging and and um, having, a, you know, this the section of the news page for a particular release is all, you know, all organized that way and and things like that. And and certainly some of the things we do at work for like um um our courses and things like that we, we uh, are always tagged and and 
um, you remember the some similar kind of things, but yeah. I think in one of your presentations a couple of weeks ago, there was a yeah. topic in the Golem side of, of package management where there's a tag of experimental release, uh, you know, in development. There's yeah. a there's a there's a tag or a or a particular text that is added to your repository so that when you visualize it on the on the GitHub. UI side of things, the, the web UI side of things, you see those extra uh, points on there, you know, deprecated, uh, experimental, you know, in development release. Um, that's not the same as what we're seeing on this visual, though. Um, this tag that we're referring to is, is more of a numeric incrementer mm, of the yeah, yeah. major release, minor release, bug fixes, yeah, yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, what what typically goes on with the, um, the the numeric version, the numeric release versions, um, you'd, uh, you'd increment from 1.01 .01 to 1.02 if the changes introduced are just um, uh, uh, minor changes that don't introduce any great, any new features, say. So these might be, a, it might be a bug fix or something like that. Um, to go from 1.01 .01 to 1.10 would be if you've introduced some new functions or something like that. So it's new features uh, in addition to what already existed in your um, package or your app or something like that. To go from 1.x to 2.x, uh, is where you've introduced breaking changes. So the there is some aspect of the package or the code or something that is no longer compatible with an earlier version of that same thing. So for example, where um, uh, test that recently went from 2.x to 3.0, um, and in the process of doing that, it deprecated a number of functions and, and, and things like that. And, and, and so the, I, I think it's called semantic versioning. I'm, I'm not entirely certain. I'll try and find the, the website for it. But um, yeah, uh, but we do use this, this, this numeric versioning quite a bit across the R development world, at least. Um, uh, anyway. Um, okay, so um, another thing is um, are the issues. So we have seen the commands like add, commit, push, and pull. Then the branches, and then are uh, another feature are the issues. So in case you, for example. Um, see a repository you want to you, you see a typo or a bug or understand or even ask something about uh, the code and everything you can uh, make an issue okay a issue is a sort of uh, that we see in practice in, uh, on, on github what what is happen but um, another way to advise the main repository of some modification that will be needed they are used to propose changes, to track bug, or to suggest features, and can be done directly by the GitHub page of the repository. And it creates a sort of message exchange form of communication with the repository owner to advi for advising about something that can be improved. So sometimes these issues, making issues, uh, it, it sounds like um, something very uh, so obviously you you don't make issues on any repositories that, that you uh, stump up but it's, it's just an exchange of communication within the repository owner so if you have some uh, information I, I believe the owner would be uh, grateful to receive uh, any uh, anything that uh, has been notice it about the repository so um, we we can see for example if we go on github and see this is my github for example 
and uh, if we are on the book club um, repository which is this you see that uh, there are e one issue and three pull requests so if I go inside the issue and see there is there is one issue that John has made okay what he did it was just leave a comment about something related to the repository and then you know obviously that would be important to receive to to uh, because it might happen that you do not realize that have some issues in your repository so it's not quite difficult to to uh, make an issue and uh, release information or notify things on a repository and then it will open up a sort of max message exchange that you can receive an answer give another answer uh, and um, let's go back on uh, our studio and see that uh, we focus on the use of GitHub on our studio and um, uh, this this thing we have already seen and basically when uh, uh, a software engineer uh, works uh, on on this thing the the workflow um, it's quite intense so you identify an issue where you need to work on and then need to fork the dev uh, branch into this specified issue and this number you it, it is possible to um, okay you can make a new issue with this green button if mm -hmm. there's an issue that has already been made like this one here yeah it would be number 12 yeah yeah you have the number and then you might i don't know do different things eh? and to um i don't know solve the issue mm. then uh, develop a feature inside the branch Regularly, regularly run dash dash git replace dev, dev, dev and git and dash, dash, dash apply, apply to include the latest changes from dev to, to stay dev. synchronized with dev so this is um, uh, like checking uh, the repository if there's any uh, anything and then uh, like stashing and rebasing all the information that have been pushed into the repository then make pull requests to dev because this dev branch is basically what the things that happen behind the scene is that right Russ? yeah, so, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. so yeah. everything passed through this dev branch which is in the underneath the, the main branch so before to reach the main branch before to uh, make any changes to it, it everything passed by this step branch so if you um, the, the another step is once a peer is accepted that means uh, that you have pushed something and uh, passed some uh, verification steps um, notify the rest of the team that uh, there have been changes in into the dev branch so they can rebase it to the branch they are working on and then finally start working on a new feature okay for for um, someone that is not uh, a knowledge of of <laughs> all these these steps this like sounds yeah, there like was a lot words. of commands in there <laughs> that weren't mentioned anywhere else in the chapter were there um yeah uh, yeah <laughs> so basically 
Pierre push pull Pierre um, rebase dev and everything uh, are all things that uh, become very clear when you do things in practice and uh, this is the the last part uh, last bit which is the I think the, the part that we are interested uh, most uh, because it's uh, the feature that we add yeah. but before that I like to do uh, something uh, just to um, f uh, show how to uh, set up a repository okay uh, github and how to use github basically okay so if uh, uh, we want to um, make a new project, okay? If we go to, to GitHub uh, and we choose a repository, let's say that uh, uh, we choose the, the, this repository and he has a, a, a web address which identifies the repository. So you can link this to your R Studio quite easily. Uh, Make a new project. So you make a new project, and then he asks, uh, "What would you like to do?" You do version control, and then git, and then add the address of the repository, and then create project. So this uh, will create um, uh, a new project. Oh, that's quite neat. Links oh, to, I didn't know yeah. that. To the repository, yeah, that that's quite easy. Uh, mm, yeah. And then important things is to uh, once you have made the repository, to check if effectively your Git is connected with your with the repository. And um, it might be tricky sometimes, but um, with a bit of experience, uh, that would be easier. Another way. Uh, another way is this, just to you go to your GitHub and then uh, there is uh, uh, like a green button that says uh, uh, make a new repository. If you want to make a repository from scratch, not linking it to, to any, you mm. make a new repository like my repo. Uh, and then make it public and add the redeem. You create a repository, simply as that. Then this is your repository. Then you have uh, uh, something uh, to, to, now you want to link this repository to your studio and you do the way I, I've shown before, like taking the, the address and make a new project and linking your uh, new repository to to your studio. I do not suggest to do any different because uh, you might get trapped to little things that mm. uh, that maybe within time uh, there is um, even other little um, slightly different way to to set up this thing. So this I wanted to. To show because, uh, it's important, and then we see that the last bit of the, the chapter, and this last bit of the chapter, what does he say? Um, he said something about uh, uh, how to add a footer layer to, to your GitHub to your uh, version saver tool. Uh, and this is uh, passed through using a, another uh, tool. Okay. And this is our the ELT check repository software integration tools. Uh, Travis, I suggest Travis or app or and then uh, mention GitHub Actions. Uh, Travis is the one that he uh, suggests so uh, most because I think it's it's more important. And wh what does it do? It automate the process 
uh, of version control. So imagine that you are working on a team, you have, mm, like, it's like on Slack, okay, when there's a certain number of book clubs and you need to verify all the changes, you need to pass through and give the, you know, the uh, okay uh, and re mm, of all of, um, of some steps, you can automate this process with some extra features like Travis, and this is Travis. Uh, it's quite um, you know you need to uh, have a look at that. I don't know if you have experience using this thing. Um, But, yes, uh, uh, a, a little bit of experience. I, I, I tend to use um, GitHub Actions now m okay. more than I I, I. I mean, I used to use Travis quite a bit. Uh, we we talked about Travis early on in the book club. It's kind of fallen out of favor a bit with the within the open source community, and there was some security issue as well that um, uh, we 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 talked about. A a, a couple of months ago, I think. Um, but yeah, uh, GitHub Actions seems to be taking quite a bit of its, um, a, a bit of the shine away from Travis because now um, a lot of the things that you would have done on Travis, like, you know, automatically run your tests and check test coverage and possibly deploy from there and things like that. A lot of that stuff can now be done within GitHub. So there's no real, um, need to step out into a third party um uh -huh. solution so much anymore i mean mm -hmm. aside from eventually cost and and, and whatnot but you get uh... Uh, he said that so I've, um i've heard about that but i didn't uh had a um maybe because I, I just didn't have the necessity to use it so um now that i've done a, a bit more uh, look at it um, it's quite easy to use because it's on a use this package so you do use this and use Travis and then you link it Travis has um, this this YAML file uh, which where you put inside some uh, um, uh, requests and um, that need to be verified and the answer with a bin binary uh, outcome zero or one if they pass through or not i don't know if it's clear uh, you find the information on the on the website but this can be used just uh, not with windows travis cannot be cannot use it with windows instead this upper layer uh, i don't know how to pronounce it this other one uh, is suitable for Windows. And then, uh, as uh, Raz uh, said, uh, this uh, GitHub action. And um, GitHub action um, uses uh, this, this commands. This is all uh, misformatted. Like, uh, still, we use this, um, but you use GitHub action check release. Or check standard, check full, and this three um, perform a standard error command check. So basically, it's a, a further, um, uh, it helps GitHub when, when you uh, get stuck. I don't know, stop me if I do, if I say wrong, but. It, it basically check, double check the, the things where they stuck, uh, if there's any mm, so wrongs, and mm. uh, to the, the check the command. Uh, sorry, no, this is the, the other one. Uh, the, the release, the standard, and the, the, the full uh, yeah. action. Yeah, I'm not sure what the difference is between the three different versions of that, but these basically, um, they they run uh, the chat command over a, um, 
uh, a package structure. So if you know, based on the Gollum um, uh, kind of workflow, you're you're building a package effectively when you're when you're building a an, a shiny app using Gollum. And as such, you can run this um, R command check thing, which will what it will do. It will go through all your code and it will check that it um it's syntactically correct it will check that all your tests pass it will check that you don't you don't refer to any functions that you haven't um uh imported from an external package or something like that and and there's loads of other checks that it does which are really quite useful um if somewhat overbearing to 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 get in place to begin with but it's, it is quite useful and and the reason that the, there's a, a check release versus a check standard so releases so it the, there are additional checks that you might do if you're sending something for publication on cran um, than you would if you were just you know building something to 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 store on github for people to download but because cran has more kind of restrictive um requirements than than you might have yourself but uh yeah um ah, you got Andy okay so basically set up a continuous integration um because the, the thing that wasn't clear to me is I use GitHub and this is a version control. Okay, so yeah, any, yeah. any changes that can, can be traced and everything, someone else or oh, myself make changes to, to, to the repository, uh, I push the changes, then I receive it on GitHub. One, once I receive it on GitHub, I need to approve these changes. Mm. Okay, and how this GitHub action get into the meaning of this this bit here? This is my question. I don't, I didn't, well, so, uh, it, it kind of re it it reduces the burden on you a little bit because um, if someone's written some code that they've added to something that you've written, and you've initially set up some kind of automated testing procedures using GitHub Actions. Um, those those automated tests will run against the new code that your collaborator has written, and if they fail, you can just point out the point, you know, that that until the code passes the the CI, you you won't be considering it for inclusion in your repository or something like that, or you can point, you know, out the the reason why the new code might fail or something like that um so it kind of it, it like it 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 reduces the burden because all the there's a lot of the time when you're doing code reviews it the, the there's a worry that you might focus on too low level a concern and by the time you've focused on you know our code style requires you to use double quotes rather than single quotes for you know 20 lines um you've um lost your stamina for addressing the more important kind of design um issues that 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 might um be more pressing but you know less e less easy to cover uh, so really, I, I don't know. I mean, things like this. So like running linting and styling and tests and um, test coverage and um, um, I can't think what else people typically do, but they're, they're, they're the kind of typical go to. If any of those steps fails during GitHub Actions, then you will get a an error message within the workflow that that collaborator can then kind of go away and work on to kind of make sure that those 
things pass before asking someone whose time's probably already quite pressed to review their code. Um, I don't know. I've got I mean, a, that, that's certainly how I see it. I have another use case example, Frederica. So when we commit our changes, there's also a dot get ignore. I don't know if you've ever looked in there and 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 recognized what directories or, or files are are not version controlled, right? By automation, by by R Studio, you're saying, you know, don't store your your R environment or don't store your uh, R, what's the, what's the other ones that, uh, they're just like specific to your local environment, but it doesn't need to be version controlled. So anybody else has to deal with it kind of thing. That's, you place those in Git Ignore. When we are dealing in our book down format of compiling the document, well, there's a bunch of uh, <clears throat> it generated files that don't need to be version controlled. It's only uh, staged so that it produces the HTML output. We don't want to continually uh, exhaust our network or exhaust you know, storage on that repository with those extra features. So instead of adding them to the git ignore, you just create a GitHub action point oh, okay. that says, you know, go ahead and, uh, and generate it, but then after it's generated, delete it, get rid of it. Uh, don't, don't keep it within the next person that's gonna clone or, or download fork the, uh, the repository. That's another use case of, of using uh, GitHub Actions. I go back to the previous uh, issue that, that we ran into with another book club, and I think I generated most of the error, but um, at any rate, or I take ownership of it, um, there was a, uh, an extra chunk of code that John had put into a GitHub Actions uh, function that when we commit the change, a, it automatically flags somebody to accept it, and then B, it also or notifies notifies somebody to uh, to review it, and then the second point would be that it automatically removes this particular uh, file or or, or directory um, after it's compiled. It's just an example, but yeah, it adds to Russ's statement of linter and, and being able to check for syntax, like the the low hanging fruit, the easy things that you don't want a human being to to uh, review. Uh, Russ, I like your statement of getting too low level, uh, <laughs> yeah. focusing on things that aren't really that important. Let an automated system take care of it. You've got bigger problems with, with looking at the code itself or, or being able to comprehend, understand what that, uh, yeah. that code chunk is doing. Well, I'm, I'm actually teaching a course on that kind of thing <laughs> on Monday and Tuesday. So it's kind of close in my mind at the moment, but, uh, yeah, um, uh, anyway, yeah, uh, uh, but yeah, it is, I mean, it is, if, if, if you have to, if, if you've already, if you've gone to the effort of making sure that there's a, a style definition for your project or, a, a, a you know, a linting tool that will go through and remove all the browser calls from your shiny app or something like that. Um, if a computer is telling your collaborator could you fix this please <laughs> it takes it take it gives it could well give you an extra 15 20 minutes a day of, you know to uh, to do to do other work um yeah so I, i'm 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 all for automation but also like sometimes too much automation can be a problem but uh, anyway yeah. um <laughs> Sorry, I, I, we've probably gone off track again. Um, so the um, da, 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 so that was uh, there was so that was the section on GitHub actions and automated uh, commands and things like that. Um, there's quite a nice little example of um, the code that you would write in a GitHub action right. setting within the uh, yeah. within the book, which is quite nice because it, it's a different type of um syntax from what you would typically write i, I think in in this and in the gitlab um configs and, and things as well um anyway uh this this one here yeah 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 um, yeah uh for me it's a bit difficult to be honest but yeah. I, be, I i trust him <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Sure it's funny though because like yeah. there's there's a mismatch of 
uh, syntax. So it should, it's R script minus E at the bottom and it's R minus E at the top. And I think he's probably copied some code incorrectly at the top. I think it's probably R script execute remotes install depths uh, in that building stub. Uh, but yeah, this is like, so the, you know, the R script minus E da 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 da. That's how you would run a, a batch command from the command line that 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 uses R. Um, so a lot a lot of our developers, you kind of get used to working within R Studio and in an active session and things like that. And there's less. I think there's be becoming less awareness of how to run R from the command line and things. So it's quite nice to see this in a um, a book for people developing. Um, shiny things but yeah and this is goes goes in the terminal yeah 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 so it's running it's it's like running batch commands on a server hosted by github um yeah so it would be equivalent to running on the terminal on that server yeah it passes the arguments to the environment correct or to the yeah. to the container itself yeah mm -hmm. i think Federica, to your benefit with, with the comment of reading this YAML file, it's more maturity or, or use case uh, uh, experience with, with dealing in kind of this serverless, or I don't want to use that word either because that's kind of a coined term, but it's, it's using these Docker containers or these, these uh, uh, instances, we'll call them. So you, you, uh, when you commit your code, GitHub automatically has this, this uh, image in the background that this YAML file is calling on. It spins up this you know, particular server, ingests your code with the uh, various uh, lines of script, um, processes whatever it's looking for. And I'm, I'm being vague with that statement because it can really be anything that you, you develop to look for. But um, the, the idea is that with a YAML file or with this syntax, it's GitHub Actions, uh, CICD, or any other form, it's usually grabbing another automated server to do some activity. That's really the whole idea here. Mm -hmm. he, he suggests some, some um, other resources, which are very interesting, but you need to, you know, I, even the Docker, uh, it's very useful. Yeah. And Here's the Docker app for the order, Colin Fay. Here's the pull command of the Docker. Federico, we've talked about this before. You haven't stepped into the world of Docker just yet, correct? If I recall our conversations, this is a, a, a bit foreign yet, um, not to feel pressured or not to feel obligated and, and going down this rabbit hole. But uh, when we start to automate a lot of our activities, uh, uh, as a developer, you're very, very apt. Your brain, your human brain is, is more apt at processing information. When we talk about automation and what uh, Russ had commented on, you've got more important things to deal with. Don't get caught up in the mundane, uh, simple tasks. Let a automated service do that for you. So when you start to step into this world of containerization and, and dealing with uh, Docker in general, it's putting the burden on that automated service instead. Uh, and I do, Russ, I really appreciate the statement that sometimes automation can be uh, too much automation can actually be a bad thing, especially if you've got um, a really um, long string of workflow and any one of the, the different points of touch can, can break uh, and create problems for you. Uh, too much automation actually can be a, a negative effect on your workflow as well. You're constantly troubleshooting something instead of uh, dealing with the more important tasks. But that was a, to be honest, this was a surprisingly good chapter. I didn't expect there to be as much content in it as there actually was. Because um, I, I thought it would just be a kind of introduction to Git and maybe a bit about like um, um, 
the the kind of team workflows the you know the the stuff like the uh what was it called git um flow um but the uh that there was the stuff about github actions and and things in here was quite was quite useful i, th I think um yeah right and uh, even the resources are very useful so um, uh, i think all of them are quite useful cool. um this is the 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 book for install the github and tell all the things about github and everything so uh, and um, there's a few others until they reach the docker the docker so um, it, it's something that um uh, it, it, it's simplified like it simplified your life basically um, so that it's very important as well and then more about brand uh, merging branches on on using git like the, this one that was uh, an extra resource to see uh, because you don't think about that you might find things uh, that you needed just right on GitHub. <laughs> you might mm. buy on Git and you find information. Cool. Cool. Before we conclude, I do have a, a rhetorical question for the team, and we can cut this off the video if required, but um, I was asked a question of using Git as a language between uh, two users. And, and the question was one of our book club members um, wanted to use a network drive. And so when I use the term network drive, I'm implying that it's a Windows based system. So both users have Git. Does it require the server to also have it? Or is the uh, structure of, of the Git language being contained within that network server. I wasn't able to answer the question or I'm actually posing it rhetorically to myself, uh, uh, trying to figure it out on my own. If I have Git on multiple computers and I'm just putting it in this one, you know, ephemeral location of storage, wherever the path is, um, does it work that way? Or do I need to interact with the server? I don't know that question. Um, so you can change your URI, you can change your path of which you're pointing at that location. That's easy enough. Instead of being on the web and, and going through all that network, uh, it's just a local service. I don't know if it still employs the same version control or the options that you have. Uh, I, I think I'm leaning towards the question is is not uh, not good. But I, I did find a uh, in that Happy Get book, uh, chapter 14, it actually makes a reference to what exactly I'm, I'm trying to answer myself. So I don't know if it, it makes the user any happier or not, but um, anyway. I, I don't actually, I, I've never actually had to set up a, a, um, a server to run Git myself. Uh, so I'm not really sh sure what the answer is, to be honest. Yeah. I imagine it's not uh simply a, i imagine it's not simply a case of you having a directory on that server that you both can access i imagine right. there's probably probably would be some um demons needed running in there as well uh, but I, I genuinely don't know about right. that end of the computing world particularly well um, I, I only smiled because the word Windows came out in the conversation and I was like, yep, um, that's where I start to usually shut down. Not, <laughs> I'm not an anti-Windows person. I just know that there's so many conflicts that are exhibited between open source and, and closed source mm -hmm. software. Um, yeah. Right. Anyway. Um, cool. So uh, next week. Uh, Ryan, you're going to be talking about deployment, which is the uh, chapter you've been building up to talk about for, it for a couple of months now, because <laughs> this is. was your motivation for studying this book was to uh, learn Correct. how to deploy uh, yep. shiny apps on your own kind of. Setup. I hope to uh, I hope to not just regurgitate what we already have here, <laughs> but actually uh, uh, give some some uh, uh, real world use case to to this particular cool. chapter. Yeah, for that'd sure. be brilliant. I hope so. Anyway, yeah. Cool. Right. I, I'm going to have to head off, I'm afraid. Uh, you're welcome to chat here for a while if you like. But um, 
right. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna head off. It was nice to see you both this week. Thanks a lot, Frederica. That was Bye. great. Cheers. Thanks, Frederica. Great job. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.